So starting an oil painting messy can make things a whole lot easier. Now there's seven benefits that I wanna talk about using this portrait painting I did of Maximus from Gladiator. Now the best example of somebody who starts their paintings pretty messy, I think is Richard Smid. If you haven't checked out his book, A La Prima, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of like progression photos of his paintings. You can see just kind of how loose and messy he starts his paintings. It's just really insightful and his paintings are mind blowing. He's one of the best to ever do it. So I felt like I couldn't make this video without mentioning him. But stick around to the end of the video because I'm gonna give you three painters that I follow on Instagram that paint in this way and whose work is absolutely amazing. So the first benefit of working like this is that you don't really need a detailed drawing. I mean, you wanna try and be as accurate as you can of the placement of things, but it's not like you have to draw out every single little shape that you see. In fact, I feel like a lot of times when people do that, when they get super specific and super tight and detailed with their drawing, they become kind of imprisoned by it and they're too afraid to get loose and expressive and they feel like, oh, I can't lose my drawing and they, end up doing what I call like coloring inside the lines. They kind of end up painting inside the lines and painting very carefully. And then they get to the end of their painting and they wonder why their painting isn't as expressive and loose as they wanted. All right, so the second benefit is that painting this way lets you off the hook at the beginning of the painting. I always felt like the very beginning moments of a painting, kind of like the first 15 or 20 minutes are some of the most important and can kind of dictate the way the rest of the painting goes. And the last thing you want to be at that point is like timid and careful and scared of messing up. You know, that's not going to cause you to paint more free and to be more expressive. I always felt like the beginning of the painting is a great time to be expressive, to be more loose, because you can always tighten things up as you go. And painting more loose and free at the beginning and keeping areas of that in your painting all the way to the end can add a lot of confidence to your painting and add a lot of confidence to your brushwork. It's also just a lot more fun to start a painting because no matter like what's going on, I know it's gonna be okay. Cause I know, oh, like no matter how off my colors and values are here at the beginning, I know I can always pull them to the right value and to the right color. You know, one of the comments I always get about my paintings is people are like, oh, like I love how loose and expressive it is yet still realistic or looks like the person or from far away it looks like a photograph but I get close and it's all messy and expressive and I always felt a lot of that was because of how I started and I try and tell students that because so many of them kind of cut off that opportunity to be loose and expressive right off the beginning because they're too scared to do it like I know it seems scary to just be all loose and everything and lose your drawing. You're like, how am I gonna get this back? But you just kind of have to trust it. It might be tough the first few times you do this, but with practice, you'll get better and you'll see in the end, it will kind of free you up more as a painter and give you more options. All right, quick side note, if you struggle with color mixing, I actually offer the color mixing video from my Foundations of Oil Painting course for free. If you wanna check that out, there's a link to it in the description of this video. All right, number three is Knowing what to paint is as easy as squinting your eyes. See, when you squint your eyes, you're going to blur everything and things are gonna become more simple. And that's what you wanna initially paint at the start. This has been very, very helpful for me. Whenever I get lost in a painting, you know, I'm like, oh, there's too much shapes. Like, wait, did I get that shape or that value? I just stop, take a breath. And I go, all right, I'm just gonna squint my eyes. I'm just gonna paint what I see. I'm just gonna trust the squint. That's what I tell my students. Trust the squint. Squint your eyes. And if you squint your eyes and you see these shades, but things are like fuzzy and blending into each other, paint it that way. Paint it fuzzy and all blended together. Again, you will be able to sharpen things up and dial in detail and add in more shapes as you go. You're not going to get another opportunity to kind of be this loose and free flowing. I mean, there are ways to bring looseness back into your painting, but I've always felt that it's a lot easier to start loose and choose areas to dial in tighter than trying to go back and loosen an area up. Another way for me to explain this is using the cutout filter on Photoshop. You can adjust it to be as simple or as complex as you want. And I always felt this is a good visual representation of what I'm talking about when it comes to squinting. You know, when you squint your eyes, you're just simplifying it into just like a few different value shapes and shapes are connected. Another way to do this is to step away from your painting and step away from your reference photo. You know, if you're standing an arm's length or more away from your reference photo and you can't make out a detail, 
or you can't distinguish between two shapes, then paint it that way. As you know, especially at the beginning of the painting, like you don't want to get too close to your reference photo. That is a recipe for disaster. You know, especially people, I see them paint from their phones and they'll hold their phone right here and they'll just be like this close and this, this, this. You're missing the big picture, you're missing the big shape and you're missing the opportunity to really open yourself up and loosen up your painting. All right, number four is doing this makes painting a lot easier. I've always said that painting is like putting together a puzzle and the more pieces of the puzzle you have, the easier it is to solve for the missing pieces. So at the beginning, when you're getting these colors and values on there, even if they're not perfect or right, it's better than nothing. You know, writers always say, oh, writing is rewriting. You just have to get that first draft so you can start changing things and fixing things. Painting is the exact same way. Like I'll just get some values and colors on there that are, you know, the best I can do right now, knowing, oh, I'll be able to dial this in and I'll be able to use more of the painting to figure out areas that are difficult. So right at the beginning of this painting, I'm breaking it down into just big shapes of flat color, just worrying about the shadow parts and the light parts. And I'm not worrying about these being perfect. Now, a lot of you are probably saying, oh, Chris, like if I try doing this, there's no way I'm gonna be able to control the paint. I'm gonna get these first layers of paint down. I'm not gonna be able to put paint on top of that. You will be able to. You just gotta remember three things. Thin to thick, dark to light, big to small. It's a lot easier to lighten paint as you go. So the best you can try and get your darks in first. That's what I did here. After I got these big shapes of flat color in, I went in and kind of found the darkest accents, you know, the darkest darks that I could, and then started finding different variations of values within the shadowed side. Even when I went to the lights, I start with the darkest light that I can so I can build lighter values on top of that. And you know, work big to small. I start with big shapes and work down to smaller and smaller shapes. And it's also easier to start with thin paint and build to thicker paint. When I'm first doing these initial layers, I'm just using paint and paint thinner. It's not a wash, it's by no means transparent, but it's not super thick because I know I'm gonna have to build paint on top of this. I always say it should be as thin as you can get it while still being opaque. Like if you have a pencil line on your canvas and you put this first layer of paint on, you shouldn't be able to see that pencil line underneath. All right, number five, working wet into wet paint is an advantage. I get asked all the time, like, do you ever stop and like let your painting dry or a certain area dry so you can build the paint on top? No, I don't. I work most of my paintings a la prima, the ones that do take, you know, a few days to do. Like I always try and keep the paint wet to a certain degree to be able to work things into it. I feel that so many beginners are scared of working wet into wet paint and they try and make the paint dry faster or let it dry and they are, just limiting so much what they can do with the paint. Oil paint is very malleable. Once it's on the canvas, you can push it and pull it. You can push it lighter, pull it darker, make it warmer, cooler. You can thin it, you can make it thicker. There's so much that you can do and it just makes it easier to change things as you paint and adjust as you paint, which is what you're going to do. And I just feel like it's a healthy mindset to know that and understand that and know that no part of the painting is done until the end of the painting, that everything is always up for adjusting. I don't just finish one part of the painting, be like, all right, all done with that part, time to go to this part. No, I'm constantly moving around and constantly comparing everything. Working wet and wet paint also makes it easy to do subtle transitions of color and value. A perfect example of this is this blue in the top of the helmet reflecting from the sky. And so I just got some light blue and just worked it into the wet paint that was already in the helmet and it blended together nicely to create that effect of reflected light. Another example in this was how I just pulled the dark background color right over the shoulder into the neck and it just helped put that area in shadow. And also when it came time to identify that part of the shoulder and the collar of the shirt, I could do it very, very simply. All right, number six is fixing mistakes is no big deal. Since I have the mindset of nothing set in stone and everything is just a collection of simple shapes, it's not a big deal when I have to change them. For example, here I had to move the mouth. And so I just took my brush and kind of like smudged out the mouth and just moved those shapes up a little bit. See, if I had like a detailed drawing, then I'd feel like, oh, you know, I lost my detailed drawing. I have to get that detailed drawing back. Like, how am I going to get that back? I've got a lot of students asking me like, what do you do when you lose your drawing? 
you know, you're constantly drawing as you go. You know, you should always be paying attention to your drawing. You know, and drawing just isn't lines, it's shapes and the size of shapes. You know, here I gridded this and I put the drawing in and I still got it wrong. Like I still put the mouth in the wrong place. Once you start painting, things are always gonna be changing. So always be aware of the drawing and be aware that you're gonna have to move things and adjust things. And it's not a big deal. It's just moving simple shapes. And kind of like a side tip to all of this is this is why you should always be standing back a lot because you will catch these mistakes a lot sooner when it's just simple shapes you have to move. All right, and number seven is you can get as tight and detailed as you want. This way of working isn't just for very loose, very simplistic painting. I feel like a lot of people confuse loose with sloppy. I'm not talking about being sloppy. I'm talking about being loose and then certain areas you can dial in tighter. As I said before, it's a lot easier to just dial in certain areas tighter than trying to go back and make certain areas looser. If you keep certain areas loose and dial in only other areas like tighter with more crisp edges and more detail, then you have both and your painting's more dynamic. For example, this painting that I did like three or four years ago, one of the main things I don't like about it is how much detail and kind of how tight I painted all these houses on this mountain here. And they're just too far away to be that crisp and, and to have that detail. If I was to paint this again, I would paint these a lot looser. I would have a lot more soft edges. I would indicate them more instead of trying to paint them exactly. They don't sit in the distance very well, in my opinion. I've always felt that a sign of an advanced painter was how they handled edges and how they would have a variety of edges in their painting, that they wouldn't be afraid to lose edges or break them up or choose where to put you know, hard edges. So always keep that in mind. I always felt like it's easier to start with a lot of lost edges and then find those edges where you want. All right, now time for three painters that I follow on Instagram that I absolutely love, that I feel like are a good representation of what I'm talking about. The first is Kai Lun Q. I love when he posts new stuff and he'll actually post a lot of time-lapse videos. So you'll actually get to see his process and just how loose he starts. He starts a lot of times like the background is putting paint on and then kind of like pulls the subject out from that background. I highly suggest checking him out. All right, next is Kyle Ma, and his paintings just have such a fluidity to them that when I look at them, I feel like the paint is still moving on the canvas. And the last is Jared Brady. Now he actually has uh, cool little videos on his Instagram where you get to see his process and it's so cool because you can see like how simply he starts a painting and how he's not afraid to use a lot of paint and to block things out very simply and then pull detail out of those big shapes. You know, working big shapes to small shapes, you know, starting broad and getting more specific. Okay, so if you like this video, you'll probably like this video as well, which gets a little more into this subject, specifically with edges and how important edges are. And I explain it using examples from all different kinds of subjects. All right, I'm Chris Fornatero here telling you to go get painting.